Hi everyone, welcome to the 19th edition of the group exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cell here at the Hanover Messe 2013. I invite you to come and have a seat, it's a public forum, we'll have a discussion quite interesting today. And uh, drinks on the house, or servers are going around and serving you water um, and soda and whatever else you may want. Please, we will be discussing something very interesting, hydrogen storage without the high pressure. Please help me welcome the CEO at Sela Energy, Mr. Steven Vollmer. Thank you for joining us. Well, I think it'd be important to uh, cover the fact of who is Sela Energy. You're new here at the Hanover Messe, it's the f your first presentation. Um, so I think the name doesn't ring a bell with everybody just yet. So I think it'd be important that you share with us who is Sela Energy. We're a new company. Um, we were set up about. Hold on, it's not working. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're a new company that was set up about two years ago. We're a spin out from the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory near Oxford. Uh, which is a UK government establishment uh, equivalent to Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Um, there are around 1,200 research scientists based there. And what we're interested in is the long-term future of energy. So the original materials were developed there, and then the company was created as a spin-out at the beginning of 2011. So it's a brand new company with a big message though. <laughs> um, you come in with a statement here saying all of a sudden that all the troubles, all the headaches we've had uh, regarding storing hydrogen, which require usually high pressure because we're trying to transport a lot of energy and in, in, which is something that usually takes expends easily. You're saying I have a solution for that. We don't need to do that. How come? That's correct. Well, the work which was started in 2007 by Professor Stephen Bennington at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory was about how we could provide hydrogen solutions, but in a way that we use fuel today. So the work that was done in 2002 by the DOE really looked at the conventional way of fueling vehicles, where we're all familiar with standing at a gasoline or diesel pump for three minutes, and then we have enough energy in our vehicle to drive 300 miles or 500 kilometers. And if you want to take the consumer back from that, it's very difficult. So the idea was, how could we make hydrogen that could be fueled in a similar way to that and give the consumer the same sort of experience? And that's what we've been developing. And you found that solution. Can you get us in a little bit of technical? I think, did you bring some of the pellets? Yeah, I'm <laughs> the only guy here with hydrogen in my pocket. So this is some hydrogen. Um, these are um, a, a complex hydride pellet. Um, what we can do with this is that we can store about 10% of usable hydrogen by weight. Uh, so they're completely safe. You can hold them in your hand. Um, what we do to release the hydrogen is that we heat the pellets to around 120 degrees C. And from around a centimeter cubed of the material, we get a liter of hydrogen at normal temperature and pressure. Um, so uh, if you want a tank uh, that will provide you a 500 kilometer range, normally as an industry we talk about uh, having um, uh, one kilogram of hydrogen for 100 kilometers of range. So a five kilogram amount of hydrogen, bearing in mind this is 10% by weight, will mean that you'll need about 50 kilograms of our material in your vehicle. And then the space it would occupy would be a little bit bigger than a conventional diesel tank. But of course it could be in a regular shaped tank that you would expect in any vehicle. You don't need the high pressure tanks. So there's very few, on the OEM part, it's quite a big advantage because there's little design requirement to change the current vehicle shape and the room and the, the allowability for this product uh, rather than going to compress gas. Uh, that's very true. So when we were doing our initial setup, we talked to consumers and obviously everybody understood how to fill a vehicle with gasoline or diesel. When we talked to the OEMs, the car manufacturers, what we discovered was that the fuel tank was often an afterthought the last thing that they designed with the vehicle. And what they do is they shape it in any way to fit around the available space in the chassis. So what they don't like 
are the cylindrical tanks that you require for compressed hydrogen because they're very difficult to package in a conventional vehicle. So the idea behind our materials is you can shape the tanks any way you want, like a conventional tank, and they can be made of lightweight materials. Most conventional fuel tanks now are blow-molded plastic and a very low-cost component in the vehicle. So there's a large advantage for the OEM, but there's also a large advantage for the end consumer because usually right now there's so much discussion about it, the safety behind compressed hydrogen. You're eliminating all that concern. We're eliminating that concern, and uh, one of the things that we find more and more is that people are concerned about safety of these systems, and as you can see, we have a very safe material uh, that's around. But the other thing that people are also concerned about is cost. How much was this uh, cost? Uh, because we've all driven miles out of our way to save a penny a litre on fuel. Um, the consumer is very aware of cost. And one of the things that frustrates me about many of these conferences is that nobody ever talks about the price. Now, um, our chairman is ex-main board of BP. He understands the oil industry. And what he would say is that gasoline is a very cheap fuel because what we pay for gasoline at the pumps has no reflection on what the oil company gets for the gasoline. So when it leaves the refinery, it leaves at 30 cents a litre. And then the rest of the cost is tax and its margin and so on. So we can be competitive at 30 cents a litre. And uh, which is quite surprising because a lot of time we've had this discussion where people are willing to pay a surplus for greener energy, which I don't believe people in the end, the end consumer, there will be a small niche of people that may be. But with this, you're, you're making it available to anybody in the public. So that's the entire idea that um, if you can drive a car, you can use our fuel. Uh, we would challenge the assumption that anybody could use an 850 bar pump to refill a tank. And I think one other thing um, that would be important to mention, because I, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are wondering, what is this made out of? How can you actually store this hydrogen in those little pellets? Uh, can I go a bit technical on you for a bit? I would love to. Uh, the, uh, this is a complex hydride. The base material is ammonia borane. Now, ammonia borane has been used over the years several times, but one of its issues has been that when you heat it to release the hydrogen, it melts, and you get a gunking in the tank. The work that we've done and patented, and this is what is new about Cella, is that we nanostructure the material to change the material properties so you don't get this gunking. And what that means is the pellets look the same when they've been used as before. It also means that we can recycle the pellets. So when you've driven your 500 kilometers, you come back to the filling station, we take the pellets out, we send them off for recycling, and we fill it with new pellets. So on a well-to-wheel -well basis, it's very competitive with all of the other pathways. So before I touch on the whole reusing and recycling of those pallets. I just want to mention to the floor, this is a public forum, so you're welcome to ask any question. If, you're, if you want to, just raise your hand and I'll come and see. We have one right now. Um, and uh, we'll get further in a minute on the whole pelleting thing. Thank you. I'm Dave. Uh, for reheating from the storage, uh, have you worked out the energy consumed for that reheating, for releasing the hydrogen from your element? So the question is, have we worked out the energy to heat the pellets? Um, you need about 1% to 2% of the energy you get from the pellets to provide the heating. Uh, now, it depends how you heat them. Um, if you come to our booth, well, what you'll see there is uh, a small unmanned aerial vehicle where we're looking to replace the lithium-ion batteries in the vehicle. And there we put lightweight pellets in the wing of the vehicle um, so that it can fly longer than it could on batteries alone. Now, to heat the pellets there, they're individually heated using a printed circuit board. So we print on the heaters, which is very lightweight. We give it a burst of heat uh, to get it going, which is 100, 100 degrees or so. And then uh, the material is exothermic, which means that it self-heats after that. So it's a very efficient process in terms of the heating. In a vehicle, we flow the pellets like a fluid because what you want to do is release your hydrogen gradually. You don't want all of your hydrogen all at once. You want to do it, release it during your journey. 
So we flow it into a hot cell, uh, which is heated from the waste heat from an engine or from a fuel cell. And this will work with an H2 ice as well as a fuel cell. And then uh, you release the hydrogen from the heat and flow the beads into the waste part of the tank for recycling. So the heating is very efficient. It doesn't require a lot of heat to release it. Some may wonder, well, you said it was base, it has boron inside the pellets. Is it different? Like some of the other issues that we had with um, fuel cell is usually that we're dealing with noble metals, which are expensive and hard to get and are hard to even process. Are we dealing with the same challenges here or not really? Boron is easier to find, maybe? Boron is a ready available mineral. Um, it's mined largely in Turkey. Turkey has 72% of the known boron reserves in the world. Um, it's not a rare earth mineral. It has very few uses today. Um, based on the current consumption, there are around 800 years of supply of boron at current extraction rates. So we don't have any, uh, any issues with a rare earth or a constrained mineral. In fact, there's probably more boron in Turkey than there is oil in Saudi Arabia, to give you an idea. And if we go come back to the recycling portion, so we would use a, a, some type of nozzle to put those pellets into our car, and the used pellets will be vacuumed back, and then you have to transport them back to a manufacturing uh, facility to get them recycled. Is this process efficient in the long run? Are we losing too much in that transportation back and forth and recycling? Is there a big loss? Like, how much does it go from the, the used pellets to final product? How much are we losing in this whole process? Well, when gasoline and diesel are delivered to a filling station, the tanker goes back to the refinery empty. Uh, now it will go back full of spent pellets. It's well known in the industry that one of the biggest sources of hydrogen is from oil refining. And what they do is that they waste a lot of hydrogen by flaring off the uh, gas um, because there's no efficient way of storing it or using it. So um, we've been working very closely with the oil industry. We were the winners of the Shell Springboard Award two years ago. And I mentioned our chairman is from BP. Uh, what we do is that we're looking at ways of recycling the pellets at the refinery using this waste hydrogen. Also, we need a bit of heat for the recycling, and there's a lot of waste heat there. So overall, um, it's a very efficient process. Is there still a dependence to polymer, to uh, dealing because it's a pellet, you know, or is it purely boron? I'm sure there's some petroleum in those pellets, wouldn't there be? There's a small amount of polymer on the pellets, and that is recovered during the process. The recycling that we've done, and admittedly this is lab scale so far, um, is around 90% efficient. So we recover the majority of the material. It's a very efficient product. Um, we have right here a fuel cell uh, ride program at the back of the parking lot. Do you think we could see a fuel cell vehicle powered by Sela pellets next year at the Hanover Messe? Well, I won't commit next year, but the year after. <laughs> okay, so we're still, it's a close timeline. So you, you would say that most of the research is complete then? What, what's the timeline? What's the next step for Sela? Well, uh, all new companies go through four stages of development. You have an R&D stage, you have a proof of concept stage, and then you go to a field trial stage, and then you hopefully a mass rollout. Um, unfortunately, many hydrogen and fuel cell companies have been at the R&D stage for a long time. And that's largely been held up, in our view, by uh, the compressed hydrogen problem. Uh, so we're at the proof of concept stage now, uh, working with automotive tier ones and other partners to develop the systems. Uh, we'll then move into field trial stages after that. Um, now, obviously, in terms of when can you go into a showroom and buy one, um, that's really up to the automotive companies. And that always takes longer than you want. So if you're saying it's up to the automotive industry, is, does that mean they're not your client? They're not your first-hand person you're working with? Well, we're a fuel supplier. So our customer would be the Shells and BPs. Um, again, if it's a public forum, so you're welcome to ask any question. If you have, just raise your hand and I'll come and see you. I also invite you to talk further and see so those pellets firsthand at their booth and see how safe they are by holding them in your hands if you wish. Uh, their booth is 
located just behind us at a, sorry about that, it's E69-1, which is in this direction. Um, and then finally, I'd like to ask you, um, would you think this is the solution that will resolve all the discussions, all the problems we've had in the past to get this whole fuel cell industry on the go? Well, we believe it's one of the answers. The it's definitely held back the industry, the safety concerns about high pressure, the fact that there aren't the network of refilling stations that you would get with gasoline or diesel. This is a much lower cost and much safer way of getting solutions to the marketplace. So yes, we think so. Would it be considered in the delivering area a um, dangerous product or flammable or anything like when you're transporting it to the refueling station? Is there a, a hazard in that transportation at all? Well, if you crashed and spilled some of these on the road, you get a lot of plastic pallets on the road. Um, will they burn? Yes, they will burn, but not as well as gasoline. So on the scale, you're there's always, with any material, there's some safety standard, but you're really reducing that that risk and that the acceptance by the end user will be a lot easier. Well, we think so, and uh, the safety is, is definitely there. Um, the uh, idea behind it is that you look at safety throughout the supply chain. It's a pretty tragic event if an oil tanker sinks. If you can do something about that with a different type of material that's much safer, that's important too. So would you uh, recommend to some of the public to invest in uh, boron plants in Turkey? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Sounds like an idea. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Vollmer. I invite you to come and discuss further this brand new technology, which is quite exciting, down at their booth again, which is located at E69-1 right behind you. Thank you so much for your time.